While you can still get annuals today, they were a much bigger deal growing up in the 80s and 90s. And if you're not familiar, an annual is typically a hardcover book tied to a kids franchise or a comic that contains comic strips and puzzles and the like. Stock and filler stuff in the run up to Christmas, you know. We got our first Transformers annual in 1985, so I would have been around three and a half years old at that point. You know, there were treasured items as a kid, so let's look at that first annual. It's a pretty basic but well-realised cover, clearly based on the toys. Mostly everything in here is, with a few items taken from previously printed colouring books that definitely use pre-production concept art for a lot of the characters. Inside we've got a line drawing of Optimus Prime, and the title page. Now this isn't the one I had as a kid, I got this off eBay, so it's already been signed by one Paul Hunt. I don't know if that's rhyming slang or anything, but get in touch if you're watching, Paul. Next up is a big double page spread with box art images of the Decepticons introducing themselves in first person. I am Starscream, Decepticon Air Commander, I am the fastest and most handsome of the Decepticons and I believe I would be the best ruler. That's fair enough. I am Laserbeak and my prey is enemy battle survivors. My function is to interrogate the enemy and I do this with my laser cannons. Huh. Over the page we've got a double page spread, this time taken from issue 1 of the Marvel comic where we're introduced to no less than 18 Autobots. I really do like how they introduce themselves and sometimes reference what the last bot said. It's fun to look at some of these designs and the colour schemes. I mean, look at Ratchet. I love it. I think these things are really great for giving you a glimpse into what it was actually like to be into Transformers in the UK back then, instead of this weird kind of pasteurised memory that we all have now. Next up is six pages of comic, and it's fine. Again, they're clearly designing with the toys in mind, with small scraps of the Marvel comic thrown in. I do like how the President of the United States calls Optimus Prime a lorry, just to remind you that this is set in the US but it is a British production. We take a small break in the action to match the faces to the name and they even did the first one to show you how. Oh, guys. Look at the state of some of these Megatron's concept head and expecting a kid to distinguish Starscream and Thundercracker here verges on the diabolical. Still, back to the comic, and those Insecticons, eh? Will they ever learn? A lovely splash page of some downtown destruction before Prowl absolutely loses his shit. Even now this puzzle confuses me. Find the exact outline of the fastest Autobot cliff jumper. Is that a, is that a fact? I mean, what, what, find the exact outline? Do you, do you, the outline around them? Or am I supposed to find the most on model one? Ugh. Next, it's our first prose story missing in action. I hated these sections. As a kid, how could big blocks of text compare to comic books and puzzles? Still, it's accompanied by some fantastic artwork. I mean, look at this Rumble sticking his fist through Track's chest in a Portland alleyway. And look at the size of him. Still, I was such a baby about these stories when I was younger, you know. <laughs> this picture doesn't have a transformer in it. <laughs> well, it kind of does because that's Trax he's driving, but you know what I mean. Trax is injured in the story and hides in car mode before being hijacked by some filthy criminals and is then befriended by this dweeb. But wait, there's another puzzle to solve. This time we're asked to find the biggest flaw in the Decepticon's flight capability. Can you do it? I'll give you a second. That's right, they quickly burn up their fuel. Right. The next page has another puzzle if your brain can handle two high pressure situations in a row. Match up the heads to the alt modes. Thankfully they've already completed one for us, matching this plane mode to Skywarp here who's wearing havoc from the X-Men's hat. And look at the state of that Megatron. Honestly, he's had more looks than Grace Jones. And even though we're already in the middle of a comic story, they're starting another one with the and there shall come a leader. Which is how Optimus Prime was granted control over the Autobot armies to defend against Megatron. And I remember this very fondly. You know, we're immediately introduced to Emirate Zaron, and there's a ton of art swipes across the story. See, this lad here just looks like Big Red from the Marvel comics. There's quite a few. Comment if you notice them. But seeing Cybertron in such detail was so much fun for me back then. And there's something really nice about the rendering throughout. The first pro story then continues, and I won't bore you with the story, but look at Inferno here. He is furious. Back to the comic and we see Blue Streak Cybertronian mode and they certainly traded up when they got to Earth, didn't they? Look at this great shot of Megatron looking down on the battlefield, it's fantastic. He's a happy boy, isn't he? Some nice action shots too. Optimus is done for, then they blow the bridge where the battle's taking place and everyone is doomed, except Optimus who gets saved at the last minute. And Megatron is also fine, so what was the point of all of that? After all that action, my brain could use a puzzle. Connect the Autobots to their alt modes, and geez, we'll just look at some of these absolute clunkers. I know these things weren't put together with any love, it's just a job for some gigging artist, but fuck me, these are awful. Next up is a game that I'm sure you'll find more exciting than any roller coaster: the hexagonal attack on Castle Decepticon. 
You start in the middle and roll the dice. Depending on the number, that's the direction you go in. This feels like the most infuriatingly slow game of all time, but still look, that lad has stolen Optimus's ion cannon. Hi hey, you! Our second pro story hunted kicks off, and just take a gander at this artwork, it's glorious. Pearl's having a tough time finding something interesting on the telly, Andy looks like he's got Cesar Romero's painted over moustache, and for all we can look back at this book and chuckle, it's all worth it for this metal as shit illustration of Bumblebee fighting a giant snake. Now you'll never believe this, but Huffer, of all people, has hidden a bunch of words in this maze. Huffer did this? Really? Alright. We move on to the prose story, I like this pink sky here, and look it's Topspin, or, or Twin Twist, or uh, who cares. Hound apparently wants you to know the name of his special light trick, but he doesn't want the Decepticons to find out, so he scrambled the words. Jeez, Hound, you really don't credit the Decepticons with much intelligence, do you? And how long is that arm of yours? The answer, a hologram is what I use. Cool. And now we reach the ending of that first comic story. There's some fighting, and then Prowl eats shit with a splinter grenade. Good. Optimus needs to provide a distraction so he brings out Roller, a living extension of Optimus Prime. I'm always happy to see Roller. I'm less happy to see the Insecticons are actually under the mind control of Ravage, who's hiding in the bushes, you sneaky cat. One thing I wasn't prepared for was how dark the ending is. Ravage instructs Bombshell to inject Optimus Prime with a Cerebro Shell, allowing Bombshell to control Prime's mind. But Prime jumps out of the way and Bombshell hits Ravage, and as the story says, the Cerebro Shell takes immediate effect. Ravage falls under the mental control of Bombshell. Unfortunately, Bombshell himself was under the mental control of Ravage. The resultant mental void leaves Ravage quite literally without a mind of their own. That's some Black Mirror stuff right there. Right, everyone heads up the road and Ronnie Reagan says the Transformers are going to get their heads kicked in. One final puzzle, get Ratchet through the maze to fix Mirage fast. For what, Mirage, what happened to you? Better get Ratchet to avoid the dangers, as the instruction says, like a small boat going down the river... Uh, some rocks, and oh, oh god, right, one of the seekers, that's fair enough. Last page is the answers page, and we get to see that this was the correct outline for Cliff Jumper. Right, yeah. The inside covers a line drawing of Megatron, and I do like the design where his fusion cannon has a handle. This is the deadly Megatron, leader of the Decepticons. He is twice as mean when disguised as a gun. Hmm, no kidding. Back covers the same as the front, really, and that's that. I was taken aback with just how much is packed into that first annual. There's a lot of things that still have to find their footing, but it's entertaining and it holds a place in my heart. It's highly recommended. Did you enjoy this look back at this annual? Shall I move on to 1986? I mean, I mean I'm doing it anyway, but it's nice to be asked, isn't it? <laughs>